Okay. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to this week's study. As we come back to the articles on the takedown of the USA and Adventism, and we recap some of the things that we discussed this last week, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his blessing, helping us to understand and to more completely grasp concepts <clears throat> that we may need at this time in our history. Shall we now ask for his guidance? Loving Father in heaven, as we join together today to open your word and to consider concepts, we ask that you join with us. We ask, Father, for your blessing <clears throat> for those that are attending this meeting. Be with us now. Direct us so that our minds might be open. Help us by sending us your spirit protecting us with your angels so that we might rightly divide the word of truth. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for your blessings, for your watch care, and for all that you're doing for us. Direct us now, Father, in all things for this. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now we're coming back to look again at some of these articles that my friend Glenn has written. Now, one of the articles here in this this part three, A Tale of 300 Foxes. Now, did you read through this? One? Yes, we did. Okay. We did. So, so, we, so you went through the first three, not the fourth, or did you do the fourth? I believe we got into the fourth as well. Okay. Yeah, because basically, like he starts out with the dilemma, and the dilemma has to do with how would you summarize what he thought the dilemma was? Okay. Hang so on. Let's just, let's just go through the. Okay. Hang on. I've got the articles open. I just got to make sure I can share it. Yeah. I mean, because I have my understanding, because he's going to be dealing with the king of the north and the king of the south. And how do we interpret. Um, these verses, like verse 36, verse 31, etc. Right. So his whole basis of this study is we want to understand Daniel chapter 11. And we have these interpretive problems. Right. That's basically right. What he's trying to say. And and that this really centers around the whole issue of the daily. Right. So to him, it's like the understanding of the daily is the key to understanding Daniel chapter 11. Right. 31 to 45. Okay. Now he never in, he never really shows why that connection really exists, though he hints at it. Correct. He's just not very directed. So that's going to be the first thing. He's going to present that dilemma. So we went through that together. I was there in that study. Now, then we dealt with Samson's riddle. So I wasn't there for that study. And in Samson's riddle, he's going to be addressing that this has to do with the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination of desolation. Right. Now, he talks about Miller's rules, especially later in his articles. But to me, he's he's not using Miller's rules. He's just pulling this stuff out of a hat. He seems to be giving lip service to Miller's rules. Yeah. But this reminds me so much of what I get from evangelicals when they interpret Bible prophecy. They just tell you that something means something, and they might have some reference to some Bible verse, but it's not really clear. Like, And so I guess the reason why I'm interested in these articles because I'm wanting us to examine how we think about things, how we actually study. Because here he's making this, this study about how to study the Bible. Basically, the series is really about hermeneutics, right? Correct. Right. How do we apply Miller's rules? How do we, how do we understand the scriptures? And, and I think that there's a lot of muddiness, not just in his thinking, but even in our own thinking about how we make connections between the scriptures. Like when we use the sim symbolic use of numbers, like none of this is arbitrary, but we sometimes do 
we are arbitrary in how we draw conclusions. That is, we skip steps, we make assumptions, we have false premises that we never examine, you know, clearly. We sort of seem to fit things, you know, just in the modern parlance of like a narrative. That is, you know, a lot of people talk about narratives, right? That is, we have a view of the world, of ourselves, of uh, the Bible, of our belief systems. And we basically are just trying to fit things in where we where we have made place for things and things that don't fit in, we just we just brush aside just with a wave of the hand, right? And many of the things that we do believe have never been examined because we don't even know why we believe those things. Is that sort of a fair assessment or would people disagree with me about what I've said? I, I think it's fair. I mean, it's, <clears throat> the more I listen to you and the more I listen to other people who don't, share what we have the more i'm uh, it's i'm challenged wow i mean i really have to get to the roots of things and really study deeply yeah so so we need to know why we believe what we believe right um on on uh, sunday i was uh you know at a wedding really nice location in british columbia outside though we had a tent to protect us from the sun because it's pretty hot but uh Anyway, I was talking to the pastor there. Now, he actually used to be, uh, he's, he's retired technically, but he was the president of the Saskatchewan Manitoba Conference here in Canada. And uh, he's just their interim pastor for a time. He's just taking this, this role. And, and he's pretty conservative, right? I mean, he believes, in, you know, in Dennis Preby's uh, work, right? He's a, he follows Dennis Preeby and what he says about uh, what we would, what what's been labeled pejoratively as last generation theology. He agrees with as we would. Now, I had a discussion with him about lots of different points. I mean, I was trying to ask him lots of questions about the church and how we uh, relate to the problems with the church and and so forth. And, and and I made him a little bit defensive in the, in the way that I was pretty straightforward and because uh, of wanting to see what his answers were. Now, when it came to a lot of these these different issues, so I don't know how, how it is, but what I find is that there, there are certain assumptions that people have made about the church. And a lot of times I think that you know, what I saw was more an emotional reaction to to things rather than a rational uh, assessment of things. Now, and I, and I wasn't being mean to him or anything, but there's there's a lot of defensiveness about ideas that there's fear. So basically what I was trying to say to him is that there's all this fear within Adventism to look at things that some, for some reason, we are just worried about the dangers of ideas. But to me, the greatest danger is the suppression of ideas. So let's say somebody's teaching some heresy, like they're teaching some idea that's not correct. What's the best way to deal with, with that if somebody comes into our church and starts teaching something that we believe to be error. What, what's what's the most prudent thing to do? Well, I would want to hear him or her out, but then say, well, look at the scriptures or look at the SOP. Compare it with what you're saying. I mean, I, I've learned not to get into a fight with people about the different doctrines and traditions and whatever it is that they're pushing. Okay. Now, if what they're believing is dangerous we should try to seek to help them to to understand, but we also need to know whether what they're saying is actually dangerous. Like we may have some biases against what they're saying. We may not fully understand what they're saying. We may have heard stories about what they're teaching, right? So the idea is, well, it's divisive, right? So this was the thing about the 2520, which I asked him about. Well, it's divisive. Now, is the 2520 divisive? No. No. Now, are people 
who believe the 2520 are some of them divisive? Some of them. Right, right. So now some of them are, some of them aren't. Like there are people who attach themselves to ideas like the 2520 who are naturally antagonistic people, right? And some of them, you know, for a while believe the 2520 because it was unpopular with the church, right? And then they move on to the next more unpopular thing when that's worn off, right? We know those types of people, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so if something is, so the question that we should ask, is it true? Right. That that's really the question we should always ask about something. Is it true? So if somebody comes in with something that we think is error, the question we, we should ask is, well, is it true? Maybe it's true. I mean, before we heard about the Sabbath, we might have thought, well, the Sabbath is some kind of legalistic uh, doctrine. You know, they're Judaizers. They're some kind of cult, Seventh-day Adventists. And so if we approached everything that way. We would never come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, of course, the the typical thing, what does the church typically do when there's somebody teaching what they consider to be heresy? What, what's the church going to do right away? Because it's dangerous, right? Heres all heresy is dangerous. So what are they going to do? They want to throw anybody that has, has promoted that heresy out. Right. So they're just going to throw people out. Now, I even had a... A, a, our conference president in Alberta say, you know, it's about nine years ago, eight years ago, that um, the reason why we have unity in the Alberta conference is we remove those that are divisive, right? Those that have false ideas. So that's how we bring about unity. Now, is that how we, God brings about unity? No. No. You know, if, if it was, you know, none of us would be alive, it would just be the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they would have unity, right? So, so obviously God works and operates differently than that. So now I know this is all a roundabout way, but the, you know what I'm trying, my point I'm trying to get to that we need to know whether something's true or not, and we need to know when we are in error, right? We need to be corrected, and this isn't isn't something that comes naturally to humanity, right? Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That means that every time we, we approach light, that light is going to show us something about ourselves that we don't want to see, that we don't want to address, that we don't want to deal with, right? Correct. So that's why it's really the most important rule is Miller's last one, which, I mean, he says we must have faith. But but he means more than just that we just trust God. If you if you read it carefully, it's really about obedience, is what he's talking about there. That that we have to trust what God has said. That is, we have to act in faith, not just you know, it's not a sort of a passive faith. It's more an active faith, right? In order to understand what is true. So all of these rules, all this hermeneutic, all of these these things don't really mean anything in and of themselves if they're not followed. And um, so, you know, so the question was that he was asking me, well, why why is this important? Because I've had that asked so many times. Why would why are you telling me this? Why should I know this? Right? Because we just need to know about righteousness by faith, is what he said. Same with this other guy I was talking to. He's really though he's going to study into the twenty five twenty. But uh, what what is the importance of what we're doing? Why, why would it be important for us to spend time studying these different things, these different issues? Like, because he calls them distractions, right? That was right. the word, the pastor. Like, these are distractions. Why should I waste my time, basically, he's saying, because if something's a distraction, it's a waste of your time. He didn't use it that way, but. Why should I waste my time reading your paper when I already know what the truth is and what I need to do, right? I need to overcome sin and that's righteousness by faith. And all of these other things are distractions. So how, how would we answer that? Well, well because for meeting these distractions more and more, sorry, Dwight, we no. need, we need to know what, what we believe and how to prove it from, from the Bible 
and from 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 Alan White, and uh, you know how to face these things because they they are they, they're definitely cropping up all over. I mean, I was shocked. I was actually shocked when I heard this fellow a couple of nights ago say that Christ was supposed to come in 1844 and uh, and cleanse the earth, and the earth was cleansed. Then. And I looked and I said, I have to disagree with that. I said, Christ entered the most holy on October 22nd, 1844. Like, I, I don't know what else is going to come, come into the mainstream church, you know? It, it's mm-hmm. just, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm... You know, I had another uh, pastor make a comment one time when I was teaching Sabbath school. And uh, the the comment related to, you know, why should why should I have to look at every wind of doctrine that comes across, you know, as a pastor? He says, why should I have to look and study into everything that comes across, you know, my attention? You know, all these different false doctrines. Why should I, why should I spend time studying them? And I said, well, you're a pastor. If you have church members that are studying error, wouldn't it be important for you to know what that error is and whether it is error or not so that you could help your church members, right? Which he he really couldn't answer, right? Because he didn't want to look into anything that he's not interested in. But I believe it's a responsibility for each of us as a Christian to know how to share with others what is truth, but also to be open for light that we may not um, be aware of. So, you know, to me, that that counsel of Ellen White, if a brother differ, right? You know, you don't just misrepresent him. You don't say that he's a heretic. You sit down with him because you may be the one in error and you need to do it in accordance with the scriptures. So when it comes to studying, right, because this is what this is all about, how we study, we have to be able to know first what we believe and we have to be able to know how to examine what we believe. And, and that's how I believe we come to a knowledge of the truth is through this hermeneutic that God has given us, which is comparing scripture with scripture, developing the character of Christ, being obedient to the light that God has given us, and and walking day by day in faith and trusting that God is taking care of his truth, right? So we have a part to play in this, in what God is doing in this world and bringing light to the world by being obedient to the light by searching for light, gathering up every stray ray of light and allowing God to lead. And I think that that's really the problem within Adventism right now is that we have a lot of party spirit. We have a lot of people who are, even if they're correct about what they believe, they're, they don't, they, they've rejected other light. So, um, so when we deal with this Samson's riddle, um, and what did you guys get out of Samson's riddle? Riddle. So this is the one where you have the the lion with the honey in it, and you know out of the eater came forth meat. Okay. Right. When we went through this, yeah. Um, as, as you're pointing out, of course, in this article, uh, the comment is made that there's no unity on the interpretation of Daniel 11 but regarding the new view of the daily that almost all of the churches agreed on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now he comes into this with the riddle. He claims he he states that this is a riddle for our time and that the riddle is going to help us understand the full scope of the daily. Mm -hmm. So now he's going to interpret the line as being Satan rather than Christ. Correct. Which doesn't make sense to me in this context. Well, here he's he's attempting, and this th- this was a an excellent point that William helped to bring out, and that Stephen helped to bring out as well. Okay. When we got into Article Number Three, <clears throat> because the point that is attempting to be brought out here is that the lion is an unclean animal, 
and that that which comes from an unclean animal should be considered as unclean. Yet Christ is represented as a lion. Correct. Yeah. Plus, also, this is an ironic story. Right. Right, which which he doesn't really pay attention to, and that Samson is a type of Christ. So all of that sort of context of Samson is ignored. Okay. Right. Uh, but we also have honey because honey has to do, we know all the other illustrations of honey, right? So we have it with the manna, right? It tastes like ma wafers made with honey. We know about eating of the little book, right? Sweet in the mouth, bitter in the belly, belly right? So he's trying to relate this, though, to the taking away of the daily and the setting up the abomination of desolation. Correct. And and I don't follow his logic at all. That's a point that is, it, it it's escaping me. Yeah. He just makes some statements. He doesn't, he doesn't really prove them, but he seems to just like ignore all kinds of other, other line, other scriptures that we could look at. So the paragraph here, the first thing to see is that even though the lion was killed and rendered apparently harmless, it only changed forms and became sweet in the form of honey. Now, did the lion change form or did the honey come from the lion? Well, the honey came from the lion. Now, see, I look at this more. See, because this whole thing is about hermeneutics, right? Okay. And right. There's a whole bunch of here, things here about hermeneutics that he's missing out on, Right. So if we look at the lion as being Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah, that that is going to unfold prophecy, and then we understand about the eating of the little book dealing with the, the honey, right, the sweetness. And, and we can see that, you know, part of this is, you know, that Christ is the lamb that's slain. So it's another symbol of Christ, not a lion, but a lamb you know, with seven horns and seven eyes, right? That he's going to be the one that opens up the little book. Like there's so many different threads here that we would we would go to about the understanding of prophecy, that that's what this riddle is really about. Does, does that make sense? Like, I mean, obviously I didn't go through everything point by point, but we're familiar enough with these verses that we can see that these threads all tie together that this has to do with an understanding of prophecy. And that's how we applied it when we applied it to this movement. Right. Right. In, in our studies last year. The symbolic representations that are given here of the lion, the honey, sweetness, etc., mm -hmm. are being misapplied much as the daily and the understanding of the daily has been misapplied. Right. So what we would do is we would take all of the scriptures, all of the statements that reference a lion and honey, and then bring them all together to get a bigger picture. But he's right. just kind of made some statements with, with just some assumptions, right? So, so we need to be careful when, we, when we're studying the scriptures that we don't just jump to conclusions, right? Right. Now, there is a way in which we then can connect this, of course, with the Bible prophecy and the prophetic periods, because we did that already in our study of Judges, because we had a line that we could put this story on, but he doesn't have that. So for him to just sort of limit this to, you know, the daily, which, which I think you know, obviously the daily is part of biblical prophecy and part of this understanding, but there's no real connection that he's making. Like he's, he's correct in that, you know, this is dealing with prophecy, right? But to just kind of say that this is about the daily and, and the moving of the daily so that the, basically the lion represents paganism and the sweetness represents papalism, which, which I have a hard time with. Because that seems to be what he's saying, right? Okay. <clears throat> now, saying that it has to be removed and placed, replaced with something else. So, so it's almost you could take what he's saying and you could apply it to the new view of the daily. You know, 
it's not very clear what he's trying to say, even though I, you know, tried to understand it. Because he's going to say, so something has been removed and replaced with something else. Well, is it replaced? Right? I don't he's, think it has been literally replaced. No, no, he's he's trying to say, well, you know, Samson eats the honey, it becomes a part of him. I don't know. I just, you know, he talks about types and he says this is a type, but he doesn't have any way to place this type, right? Without a line, he's just he's just stabbing in the dark, right, on, on his interpretation. If you use this type of interpretation, you could come up to almost any meaning of this story, right? Because yes. he, the, even this idea that, you know, Samson eats this honey and becomes a part of him, is that really part of the story? No. No, right? So he's he's taking from he's he's arguing from analogy, right? He's you know, from this type, and then he's adding things that in the story are not really part of the story, because that's not really part of of what's being illustrated. It's not tracking with the point that he's trying to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah, and I'm not doing a very good job of trying to to. Yeah. Because what I really think that, you know, and we're, we're talking about this, but how we understand, how we interpret the scriptures, that, that what he's doing is very typical of how we do things, right? Like, I'm not singling him out as like some unique individual who's, you know, doing this. I would say that we do this all of the time in all kinds of ways in life and in our study of the scriptures, where we draw conclusions from things or we add information, um, right? When in Revelation, when it says we're not supposed to take away from or add to the words of, the, of this prophecy, right? It's not so much literally talking about like, you know, some, somehow in a, in a translation, we add some word or we ignore some other word, right? What it's, what it, what it's talking about is that we need to take all of scripture and only what scripture is saying as the standard of truth. Right? We're not going to add to scripture our own ideas. And we're not going to ignore parts of scripture because it doesn't fit in with our thinking. I mean, that's the obvious meaning of, of what it's talking about. Sometimes people, you know, try to limit that. And that's the way I understood it when I first read it. I recognized I need to accept the entire Bible. Not just the book of Revelation, but but the book of Revelation, I need to understand. It. And I can't just ignore part of it or put my own interpretation on it. So he has this opportunity here to actually examine his own thinking. But this whole series is really about hermeneutics, but he never really understands it. He never really understands the point. And we'll see this later in his articles. Okay. So any more thoughts on this part? I know I'm, I'm doing a lot of talking well, here. But. It's interesting when, when we look right now on this, on just honey by itself, there's mm -hmm. 54 different references to this in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. and, so, and we know some of the main ones that we have used, you know, honey, which enlightens the eyes, Right. Right. You know, it helps us to see, um, you know, obviously it's it has to do with doctrine and with the teachings of God's word. Right. Right. So, yeah. So you um, is there any ones that you got there that you could just read since you I'm, got the search oh, there? OK, what we're dealing with is Hebrews 1706. Of course, we have the one here. Exodus 16:31 in the house of Israel called the name thereof manna and it was like coriander seed white and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey mm -hmm. so throughout Genesis and also in Exodus we're being told about how the children of Israel are going to be coming into a land that will be flowing with milk and honey mm -hmm. And, of course, this is giving a 
a type of representation of almost like rivers of milk and honey. Yeah. So and and the Jews would understand that symbolically, not literally. If they weren't right. really believing they're going to go to a place that's um, you know got rivers of milk and honey, but uh, a lot of a lot of the others that we come into, like in the Book of Job, he shall not see the rivers, the floods, the brooks of honey and butter. How many times have we seen brooks of honey? Well, I haven't ever, but uh, but. Psalm 19.10, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. I've heard that turned into a scripture song. So, yeah. No, and we know, like, I mean, a land flowing with milk and honey can refer to the good pasture land and the flowers, you know, like. But but the symbolism that's used there that honey has is um, that it has to do with doctrine. Right. And milk also is a symbol of doctrine, right? Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may live thereby. So so this milk and honey doesn't just symbolize uh, physical prosperity, but spiritual prosperity, right? That is, you know, the understanding of God's word and being part of God's purposes and being fruitful, right? Spiritually fruitful. Now, this other comment. If you think about that for a moment, Samson should have become a part of the lion's body by virtue of being eaten by that lion. Well, Samson wasn't eaten by the lion. Right. We have an example, another example in scripture where David, as a youth, slow, slew a lion. Yeah. So David did not get eaten by a lion. So when he makes the analogy that instead the lion actually becomes a part of Samson's body by virtue of him eating the honey, and then stating that as something is eaten and assimilated, it becomes part of you. That's kind of a leap. Yeah, and plus, really, the honey is not part of the lion, right? The honey comes from the flowers and the bees. It's just it's just like a container, that's all, <clears throat> for, for, the, for the hive. Um, so as he as he goes through this, the next he said the second point to consider is the fact that this honey came out of an unclean animal. Now, when we when we relate that statement, looking at the third article about the three hundred foxes, yeah, the comment is made about how the foxes are representing. Um, Gideon's 300 men, or they are representing the 300 charts, and nothing is being said or addressed to the fact that the fox is an unclean animal. Yeah. But, yeah, and he also talks about how there's two kinds of honey, which I don't agree. Okay. Right, because he says the sweetness of honey is significant things that it works with both truth and error. And I don't find any example in Scripture that honey represents error. Okay. Right. Now, the point that something is being removed and replaced with something else. The first thing, the lion couldn't get the job done, that it was unable to kill Samson, and is now replaced by something more effective and very subtle. Right. So he's looking at this honey as a type of error. Correct. Right. Which, you know, which we see that, that this is actually really about a message, right? And I mean, it's about a truth, prophetic truth. That, that that this riddle is about, right? And we also relate Samson's riddle to the riddle of Revelation 17, right? So that's how we related it when we looked at this on a line historically and we, we looked at this movement, we could see that, that Samson's riddle related to that riddle. But here, here the situation is a little, I mean, the, the difficulty I'm having with this Samson is entering into a league with one that he's not supposed to. He's entering into a marriage covenant with one that he's not supposed to be seeking to be married with. Yeah, except we, we just ignore that part of the story because Samson is a type of Christ. Okay. And so... We, we're we not looking at what Samson's doing morally as really the issue in the story, right? 
But in this case, with the lion and the honey, he yes. is looking at this from a quasi-moral aspect. Glenn, Glenn is, you're saying? Yes. Yeah. yeah, which I don't, which I wouldn't, right? I, I mean, I just see Samson as, as a type of Christ, which is also representing this movement in some ways, right? But primarily, he's a type of Christ. And that this is about the proclamation of the message. It's about the understanding of the message. And like, I mean, we're not going to go through the whole study of Judges again, and even this study. But we, we very specifically could say that this relates to this message that this movement had in connection with July 18, right? That's, that's how we, we looked at, at Samson. So it has to do with this movement now. And the way that we did that was very systematically and methodical, right? It wasn't just, you know, us pulling things out of a hat and saying, we think it meant means this, but he seems to just pull things out of a hat, right? It's not, right. there's no, there's no applying of Miller's rules. There's no method and and it doesn't naturally come from you know prophecy being fulfilled our history there's no context in which which to address this now he is just applying this to the daily right it's his whole issue is has to do with the daily right and, and he thinks that this is a key but i don't agree with his interpretation of this text i don't think it's 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 following Miller's rules to try to get this to relate to the taking away the da daily and the setting up of the abomination of desolation. There's just no way that I could apply it in that way, right? And then he's going to, you know, in this what is stronger than a lion part, right? Is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but Christ the lion of the tribe of Judah. Christ as a lion roars as well, and roaring is used in connection with prophecy. So he he. He knows some of these types of things that he should be uh, addressing, right? So we know that Satan is a counterfeit, right? Um, right, and so he he brings some ideas that 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 could be used and brought in and applied, but then he doesn't follow through, right? Because he's going to say, when Satan roars. Many will stand in our pulpits with the torch of false prophecy in their hands, kindled with the hellish torch of Satan. That's the statement from uh, Spirit of Prophecy where it talks about um, that we will have in meetings of the open air and so forth. Uh, our ministers are going to be urging upon us the necessity of keeping the first day of the week. Right. That's where that statement uh, comes from. Um, he, SPTA 11. 8.1. What what is that? Okay. What's that? What, page, what page are you on? What's it under what's what is stronger than a lion on um Samson's riddle? That subsection. So I'm not I'm in the actual document. Yeah, it's gonna be scroll down more. Okay. Scroll down more. Yeah. So SP Special Testimonies. Is that what that is? Yeah. It's what TA though? Hang on for a second. Is it miscellaneous collections? So I don't see this abbreviation anywhere. Yeah, because that, that quote is uh, quoted multiple times. Well, it, I know it's in Review and Herald. Spe Here it is. So, yes, yeah, special testimonies to ministers and workers. Right. That came okay. out of manuscript 92 of 1897. And was requoted three times in the testimonies to ministers and gospel workers of 1923 in the 1888 materials and last day events. Okay, so okay, so this is a different quote. This one is, yeah. So there's one. Um, it's another quote which has some similar words, but has which I'm thinking of. This isn't the same one. Anyway, but um. So there's a bunch of things that he could bring in that, that he doesn't really seem to bring the threads together, I guess is my point here. So then he's going to jump to, you know, we need to look at the book of Revelation to understand the daily, right? So books of Daniel and Revelation are one. 
right? These all these different things about Daniel and Revelation. Now, so when we studied um, Revelation 12, we saw that there was this connection to, or, or Daniel chapter 12, this connection to Revelation 10, right? Because it's going to deal with the end, the time of the end, and all the way to October 22nd, 1844. So that period of time, that 46 years in there is going to be addressed. Millerite history, which is going to be sealed up. And we can say that part of what was sealed up was really an understanding of the daily, correct? Right. Right. That is, Adventism doesn't understand the two desolating powers, paganism and papalism. Correct. And the periods attached to them, right, the two 1260s. So that's one of the things that's unsealed when the seven thunders are unsealed, is the correct understanding of these teachings, right? Because we have this view in the movement that the uh, the seven thunders were seven events, which kept changing, right? As as the movement uh, progressed, we we kept labeling different events as the seven thunders, and then we we said the seven thunders were repeated in our history, which I don't think is the case. That is, the seven thunders are unsealed in our history. That is the understanding of Millerite history. Now it does happen in connection with the movement moving through the way marks, because as we progressed as a movement, as we were repeating Millerite history within the movement itself, then we had the seven thunders unsealed. And I would say that we, they unsealed, this movement has unsealed the understanding of Millerite history, which, which we can, we can demonstrate. We can show people all of these way marks and the truths attached to them, which Adventists can't do. Adventists can't tell us when the first angel's message arrived or when it was formalized or when it was empowered or the second angel's message. When did it arrive? Was it formalized? When was it empowered? When did the third angel's message arrive? And then when was it formalized? When will it be empowered? Right. Adventists don't know these things. They don't understand the place, the timing of of these messages they don't understand their content so so when we deal with these um you know his conclusion which is going to be basically next it's not much of a conclusion no it's not right and and so i'm just going to read this part it says in looking at the current prevailing views of daniel 11 31 to 45 and adventism and as abroad it can be seen that they have one thing in common that almost all are united on the new view of the daily um, now, I don't really think that that has anything to do with their interpretations of Daniel 11, verse 31 to 45, to be honest. But so he says this one th thing lays the foundation which affects the rest of the building. In other words, the Lord was in the slain of the lion, but it was afterward when Samson turned aside to look and then ate of the honey that the stage was set for his fall. Which doesn't make any sense to me. It's. It's not tracking. It's not giving a true conclusion because it's it's more like this green item has a relation to this orange item. Right. But it doesn't tell us, doesn't show this. No, it's not. Right. And then he's going to say, we're going to study the 300 foxes. Now, that one was even more of a puzzle to me, the 300 foxes. Okay, so go to that one. Now, I don't know if he meant a pun by the way he entitled it, or if he, or if he just doesn't know how to spell the word tail. But, but maybe that's maybe he he's using a pun, a tail of three hundred foxes, right? Because tail is T A L E, not T A I L. Oh, you changed that on yours? I did. On, on the website, it's got T A I L. Interesting. So how did you get that? I copied it. Okay. Well, on the website, it's got T-A-I-L. Okay. So I'm not sure how. <laughs> maybe maybe this uh, your spell check uh, or grammar check fixed it. It could be. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Okay. Yeah, because I'm just looking at the original article. So on right. the website. So he's going to talk again about types. And, Which he, and then what's that? I said that's something that he's he's tried to do quite a bit. Yeah, he's going to keep talking about types. Now, of course, the connection he makes with the 300 charts and the 300 foxes, we make that connection as well, right? We also make the connection with Gideon's 300. And we also made the connection with the two periods of 150 days in the story of Noah, right, with the flood. So he talks about how they come in pairs, and I don't quite follow the logic of that. Because if they were pairs, the first and second angels' messages, then you'd only have 150 charts, but I don't know. So he's going to have that that these foxes represent a work that was done in Millerite history in the proclamation of the first and second angels' messages. Now, how did we apply the 300 in in our study of the 300 foxes? Stephen, you, you had made a chart dealing with the 300 foxes. Yeah, I can't remember. I'd have to look at it, look at it again. <laughs> okay. Um, here, maybe I can bring it up. Okay, so one of the things about uh, the story of the foxes is it's going to come in a context of the wheat harvest, right? Right. And And we had connected this to the first you're going to have the first fruits, and then Pentecost, and and then you have this this wheat harvest uh, in connection with that history. So, in the in the lines of Samson, we put the three hundred foxes as the arrival of the second angel's message, and in different lines we put it in different places. Um, but yeah, I can't find this chart that Stephen made. I thought I had it here in this. Document. Yeah, 300 showed up quite a bit in our study of Judges. Can't find this because he had a really nice chart. Maybe it's in your other document. Yeah, I can't find the chart I was looking for. Because you had somehow you connected this. I can't remember where, Stephen. I can't find it either. I'm still looking. <laughs> yeah, well, so anyway, has this about pairs, the first and second angels' messages? Uh, he's going to tie it from Philadelphia to Laodicea, so he's going to deal with Millerite history. Now, we know that there was also 300 of the 1850 chart made as well, right? So there was 300 made of the 1843 chart and 300 1850 charts. The 1863 chart, they made a lot more charts than that, but early on there wasn't that many. And it took them a while because there wasn't that many Adventists in 1850 as there was Millerites in 1842 when they made the 1843 chart. So um, it took them a while to actually run out of the 1850 charts, but they had 300 printed at the time. Now we only have one 1850 chart that survived, right? Like, like nobody right. knows of another 1850 chart. Like we have a few of the 1843 charts that survived you know, half a dozen or so that I know of. Okay, now I, I know of two different 1843 charts. Yeah, well, I know of six. Okay. At least, because um, I have photos of them. There's ones with the stone and ones without the stone and ones with the goat heads and ones without, yeah. And uh, one even without the, the, the horn coming down. Really? Yeah. So it has no horn between eight uh, to the side of 164 and 158. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Well, I could be wrong about that one. There's maybe the only, the only one I have with the horn coming down is the 1850 chart. Yeah, but there's anyway. Forget about that. I can't remember. There's some other thing uh, about. The 1843 chart that's missing. I thought it was the horn, but it could be wrong. Anyway, so I know there's a number of different charts, and they look quite different because they're all colored separately, right? They were just uh, 
black and white lithograph and then the colors were added individually. So anyway, in his conclusion of uh, 300 Foxes, he says, these two charts, the 1843 and 1850 chart, have been subject of much controversy within Adventism. It is not my purpose to try and convince anyone concerning the validity and significance of these charts, though scripture and spirit of prophecy bear that out. Rather, it is to show that they are actually the three angels' messages in both a written and pictorial form. More than that, they represent the actual experience the Millerites passed through in their order that qualified them to give the message. And that is the point, which doesn't seem like a conclusion. It's not. Yeah. And then he adds some more stuff that's not really a conclusion. It would be something that you would put earlier in the article. So, <clears throat> so, but what he's mainly trying to do is show that the 300 foxes are connected to the charts. But he doesn't really show the purpose of this so much. He's going to talk about, you know, one of, talk about the different church periods that are described in Revelation 2 and 3 that are in that period of time from 1790, you know, that's Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, right? One of them is the Philadelphian church. In the historical account, Samson assembled 300 foxes with torches between their tails and sent them off into the Philistine fields to burn up the stocks, shocks of standing corn, the vineyards, and the olive yards. I don't even follow what the connection that he's making in that paragraph. Well, it's almost like he's trying to say that the foxes were a representation of the message of the Millerite time frame and that the foxes were a godly power. Okay, so what does that have to do with the Philadelphian church and what does that have to do with the historical count of Samson with the 300 foxes? How is he relating that to Millerite history in the Philistines? So is it is it the Protestant teachings are being burnt up by these foxes? Is that what it is about? That that the charge... was, that's a possible one way of looking at it. Question that I had asked is this, you know, attempting since this, the foxes were seen as being unclean, is this possible that this was also a destructive power? But here again, we're asking questions to try to understand what's being said because the overall presentation doesn't truly come to a conclusion it doesn't it doesn't give a i it, it it's not presenting what he's really trying to get at yeah so i'm i'm not sure what he's trying to get at okay so then we deal with uh, the next article which is um part 4 yeah part 4 so samson's descent into legacy this one i had great deal of difficulty with so i guess he's saying that in part three you know you've got this philadelphian church that's the millerite history august 11 1842 october 22nd 1844 is when philadelphia is and then we have uh this samson's descent into laodicea so maybe he's trying to follow down follow the process okay so, so he's going to deal with the blindness of Samson, right? Okay. And as as a characteristic of Laodicea. Now he he focuses a lot on what he calls Samson's fall. Now, because Samson's a type type of Christ, we know that Christ doesn't fall. So why 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 is Samson this ironic type of Christ? What what was the purpose that that we understood about that? Why why do we have this? representation of Christ in the Old Testament through Samson as a type. What What is he typifying about Christ? His strength, his leadership. Well, well we, we said it was his human nature. Okay. Right? So that Samson rep represents the human nature of Christ, that Christ overcomes. Right? That That's the way that we understood it. You know, and if you look at like two different types of Christ, you got Joseph and Samson, which are really contrasted, right? Right. So, so why do we have this this such a 
a negative representation. I mean, we have Christ's nature. We're saying Christ's human nature is being represented. Why is God doing this in, in the story of Judges, that we have Samson in this way? If we think about the bigger context of Judges. Is this ironically not showing how one so strong in literal strength can be so weak in his spiritual understanding? Mm -hmm. Okay. But still in the context of Judges. So we think about Judges. Judges is this time where every man does what's ever right is in his own eyes, right? Right. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. There's no king in Israel. But every man does what's right in his own eyes. And and it's going to sort of start with that and end with that, right? Right. I mean, that's kind of the whole idea of that period of the judges. So we have all of these stories, and Samson is going to be one of the judges. He's going to deliver them from the Philistines. So Christ, you know, he took upon our nature in its fallen condition to redeem us. Is that a stretch? I don't think so. Now, he's ultimately going to be victorious. Now, now he's going to try to relate this to Laodiceans. Now, I think the main thing that he's going to have is Samson's blindness. I mean, you could say he's wretched, I guess, and miserable. Um, maybe you could say he was poor. He's blind, naked. I guess you could pl apply those things to Samson. But if Samson is the type of Christ... He's showing that Christ can overcome all of those things. And it's going to be in his death that he, he redeems, right? And he's going to, we know that there's, he's got this, uh, the two pillars that he's going to knock down this, this house, right? This temple. Now he's going to relate this to, um, First, going to start talking about the Seventh Day Adventist Church uh, size and organization that we're rich, increased with goods of need of nothing. Now, is that where uh, Adventism becomes Laodicean? I mean, that's where we are now. But what made Adventism Laodicean? Now, how far did you get on this this one, Dwight? I don't remember that we got that far on it. Okay. I reviewed quite a bit of what we did on the 28th and 29th as I drove back last night. Mm -hmm. um, but I had about 30, 35 to 40 minutes to finish reviewing of the presentation on the 29th. And I just did not finish doing that last night because I was so tired. Okay. So he's going to be, so he's going to focus on Samson employed in prison. I don't know if you want to read some of this, Dwight, or where he's got the fetters of brass. He's going to focus on the brass, and then he's going to have a conclusion. Right, and but he, the, yeah. the point that I recall on that is he never really touches on the relevance of the brass. Right. He doesn't seem to follow through with his thoughts. Right. Right, that we must just see them. Now, his conclusion, by adopting and employing the methods of interpretation of Protestantism, we are allowing them to confine us to their system and to remove from us our weapons. Their conclusions become our conclusions because we are using their formulas. Right. Now, and then he's going to quote 1 Samuel 13, 19 to 21. There was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his uh, coulter and his axe and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the go goes. In their day, the Israelites went to the Philistines to have their implements sharpened. These implements were used to cultivate the ground so that the crops would grow. In our day, we are going to the Protestants to have the theology of our ministers and scholars sharpened. Our ministers and scholars are to help us grow spiritually, but the Bible records, yet they had a file. In other words, the Israelites had a file, and that's actually not what it means. Um, okay. Right, so he's he's just misreading the scriptures, uh, because saying, yet they had a file for the Maddox, that means the Philistines, not not the Israelites. 
So I don't, uh, you know, because he's saying, well, they had a file, but they didn't use them. They went to the Philistines instead. But I don't think that that's what the verse is saying. And I'm just looking at the Hebrew here. Yeah, so the word yet isn't even in the Hebrew at all. It says here in the Jewish Publication Society, but all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his plowshare and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. And the price of the filing was a pim for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks with three teeth and for the axes and to set the goads. So the idea that the Hebrew has here is about a price that they had to pay, not that they had a file. Okay. Other translations, the charge was two thirds of a shekel for plows. So the, the King James just misses the translation. So in, in this, Young's literal translation would be a better, would be better according to the Hebrew? No. Well, and there hath been, no, it's, so there is, um, okay, so let me see if I can get this. Uh, okay, so yet they had, haya, so that's just there exists, right? That's where we get Jehovah from, that word. 1961 is the Hebrew number. And then they have uh, file, 4677, and then 6310, the mouth, that is, uh, by means of blowing, specifically an edge, portion, or side, or according to. So this is where they get the word uh, price. So the way that the, that the translators are translating it, not the King James ones, but other ones, is that there was a, a cost for the Maddox or cost to, to do this. So they were paying money. Uh, to get them filed. So they were paying money to their enemies. Yeah. To sharpen their, their implements. implements. Yeah. It, that's what it's actually saying. Not that they <clears throat> had their own file. Okay. Okay. So, so it kind of wrecks his analogy there. So so I don't see what he's saying in the story of Samson, that it's about, you know, Samson's descent in the Laodicea. I don't see that that's being illustrated here. I mean, Samson, right from the very beginning, is is ironic in his typology of Christ. What What we see ultimately is Samson's victory rather than a descent into Laodicea. Right. See that Christ overcomes human nature. So I haven't gone through um, these ones, the next ones, part five, Gideon's men. I haven't gone through what he said about that, Jacob's sheep or proposal. I've only gone through, so that's five, six, and seven. But I have gone through eight, nine, ten, and eleven, and twelve. I've looked at those. So these ones, five, six, and seven, I haven't read yet. <clears throat> yeah, we're going to we're going to wind up having to go into five, six and seven because we hadn't addressed yeah. It whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. So I just figured we would review those. And so tomorrow, today's Wednesday, right? Yeah. yeah so tomorrow we can uh, look at uh, Gideon's men. So, okay. of course, that's something that we've studied in detail when we study judges. OK. OK. So hopefully, hopefully this is helpful for people. Yes, Stephen? Yeah, I sent you a diagram on WhatsApp. Right, that's the diagram I saw before. So you use the foxes here. I'll just bring it up. Okay. It was uh, paralleling midpoints. Right, and it was the 300 years that was right. the, the thing that you're doing. And and. Um, so this is the 300 years from when Methuselah is born to Enoch is taken, right? Because you got the 65 years and then the, and the midpoint. Then you're going to line that up with Jacob and Joseph and then with the midnight cry. But you also have the two periods of 150 days that could be from the story of Noah, the flood. But in this one, you got these 65 years. 
Yeah, so you had 300 years from the time the land divided. Yeah, yeah. 677, and then you have, so that was like a mirror, and then just put like a 65 years from there, going backwards, paralleling Enoch. And then mm -hmm. uh, you had from that midpoint when uh, of the 300 years of Enoch, it was 93 years later that uh, Adam died, and he was 930, so like 10 times 93. And yeah. then just sort of paralleling out with the 93 days from the, the 1844 with the uh, midnight. Yeah. yeah, July 21st is the midpoint there, yeah, yes. with the 93 days to the 10th day of the seventh month. So that 93 symbol connects with that midpoint. And then mm -hmm. it was, that's uh, from when Enoch was born until that midpoint, it's 215 years not paralleled with the midpoint from when Abram left Haran mm -hmm. to when Joseph and Jacob reunited. So there's like some sort of like a sort of be ties in with each other, these midpoints. Yeah. And so the story of the the two fox, the, the 300 foxes, which have their tails tied together. That gives us the midpoint, right? That's the idea here, that there's a midpoint. Yeah. So and we saw of... it in the two periods of 150 days in the flood. So so, so it, it brings us to this chiasm, which he completely misses in his study, right? He's, he's not going to apply that at all, at all. Okay. Thanks for that, Stephen. Dwight? Okay, any other comments or questions at this time? Okay, shall we then close with a word of prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together. We thank you for these examples, these words of admonition, and all that you are showing us. Direct our steps today. Help us now so that that which is done may bring glory to your name and to your character. Direct us now for this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.